Several weeks ago, we, we posed the question, what are your biggest questions about the Bible, about life, about culture, about society, uh, and about the Bible? And we've just been making our way through that list, and you guys asked some great questions, great questions. In the last few weeks, we've been all over the map. Today, I want to answer the number one question that came in. Matter of fact, there wasn't even a close second. Like the second question, um, most asked question was far for like laps behind this question. And I'm so glad you asked it because everybody's asking. Everybody's talking about it. Politicians are talking about it. Schools are talking about it. Libraries are talking about it. Uh, entertainment is talking about it. Disney Channel's talking. Everybody's talking about it. The only people that's not talking about it is the capital C church. And I don't know why that would be. The church has to be a safe place to talk about real questions, especially when the Bible has clear answers. So we don't want to shy away as Christians and as a church, we don't want to shy away from cultural tension. We want to lean in to what the Bible says so that we are not doggy paddling in the tension of culture, right? So where the Bible is clear, we want to embrace, and let me just preface where I'm about to go with an understanding of the framework I'm going to use to get to the destination that we get to as Christians. Keep in mind, the question on the floor is, what does the Bible have to say? So we're not talking about what does, what does religion say or church Tradition say, we're not talking about what does the Baptist say, the Assemblies of God say, the Methodists say. No, 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 no. We're talking about what does God have to say? Because at the end of the day, you're not going to stand before a religious entity or a boardroom. You're going to stand before. We're going to stand before. Okay, okay, yeah, so we're there. And uh, so let me just start here. There's two different world Views. And it's important that you know this because this is not just true of the topic we're about to unpack. This is true of our entire life, how we think, how we move, what we believe. Let me start with the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview says that my life ought to be centered around God. Okay, now think about this. We don't appreciate the word God like we ought to because we throw it around like an everyday term. We even use it in slang context. Oh, my God, and oh, God, and oh, no, 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 no. But if you would really digest that word, God, yeah, see, he's like, yeah, pay attention to that, boo. That's my boy down there preaching. And uh, thank you for the, thank you for the amen. And uh, now watch this, watch this. If you really think about the word God, it really deepens how central he ought to be to our lives. God. That superimposes the idea that he is the ultimate knower. He's the ultimate wise one. He's the ultimate counselor. He's the ultimate protector. He has the ultimate strength and power. Who could stand up next to God? Who could, who could MMA God? Who could, are you smarter than a fifth grader? God. Who could out-debate God? No, if there really is a God, then you would have to admit he has to be the center of the world. Because our lives are centered around God and his truth, his word, we understand that God created the earth. Therefore, whatever happens on earth, he has the right to define and to explain. And to, whatever he created has... An, has an original uh, intent behind it. And he gets to describe the intentions behind his creation because it was his to design to begin with. I was waiting for God to ring another phone to you know, get me there, but he didn't do it. Okay, but we'll just move on. Uh, so all of life centers around God. God created the world, and therefore he gets to define what happens on his planet. Sin entered the world because people do not like what God has to say about certain matters. Because sin entered the world, there was a great separation between us and God. Therefore, we needed someone to save us from the effects of sin. We have found that Savior. His name is Jesus. Jesus offers us salvation from the effects of sin, being eternal separation from God, resulting in a place called hell. 
Because of that salvation, we now have access into God's home, heaven. It's interesting, even non-Christians believe that there is a place called heaven, and to them, everybody's going. No, no. Earth, then, is not our ultimate home. This is temporary. It's camping. It's camping. It's temporary. This is glamping, really, right? It's just earth. Therefore, this is God's life. As a Christian, I have to come to the conclusion because God is center. I'm created by God for a purpose of God, to honor God, to glorify God, because I believe he is my savior, saving me from my sin. He's offered me salvation and my hope for eternity is in heaven. It's God's life. This is God's life. Therefore, it's God's rules. So I don't get to define God's rules for God's creation. He defines the rules because it's his life. You follow me on this? Therefore, the primary goal of a Christian worldview is to, the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. So even God's laws in the Bible, God's rules in the Bible, they are to get us to be holy. They are formatted in such a way that as we pursue God, we become more like God. We'll never be God, but he wants us to be more like him in that regard, holy. Contrary to the Christian worldview is the non-Christian worldview. This is me-centered. Because there is no God, my life revolves around me. Who else would I live for? Who else would I worship? Who else would I pursue? No, my life will revolve around me, and because there is no God, I'm a byproduct of time and chance. Big bang, molecules came together, and I grew from the parts of a, of a lizard, and then, and then you know, my ancestors were monkeys and all that kind of, and big bang theory evolution. No, no, no. Because my life revolves around me, there's no need for a God. Therefore, creation was accidental. Because I'm a byproduct of time and chance, there's no such thing as sin. Because you do what's right for you, I'll do what's right for me. You have your truth, I have my truth. And because there's no sin and there's no ultimate absolute truth, there's no need for a Savior. And because there's no need for a Savior, there's no such thing or reason for salvation save me from what there's no hell only bad people go to hell yet nobody can find a metric usable um, for the globe uh, to define what truly is hell worthy and what isn't everybody thinks they're going to heaven because after all they're not as bad as hitler the problem is even hitler found somebody who was worse than him so we're all just left up to our own opinion on who gets in therefore earth is our ultimate home this worldview says, it's my life. Let me be me. Stop judging me. My life, my rules. I'll decide what's best for me. Leave me alone. The goal of the Christian is be holy as God is holy. God's rules, God's life. Over here, the goal is not holiness, it's happy. So whatever makes me happy is good for me. Now watch this. Are you hanging with me? The problem with modern day Christianity is that we want the best of both worlds. Where we want to blend these together. We want to take hot passion for God and cool passion of self. Man, just let me bathe in the coolness and the swag of myself. And, uh, and here's what we end up with. We end up with, yeah, this is God's life because I want heaven, and I do believe in a higher power, but it's God's life, my rules. Therefore, I get the benefits of what God has to offer, but I get to tell him how he chooses uh, to operate in humanity. Therefore, are you ready for this? God's job is to make me happy. And we formulate our life around if it doesn't make me happy, it must not be God's original design. And so we build a theology around the idea God exists to make me happy. And if it doesn't fit with my desires, my happiness, my orientation, therefore it must not be God. The question on the floor we want to answer today, asked uh, by a long shot, what does the Bible have to say about homosexuality? And I'm so glad you asked, because again, everybody's talking, it, talking about it except for the church. 
And that doesn't make sense why, why the subject would be taboo. I want to say this from the very beginning. There are several ways that I could have approached this subject. Originally, I started writing this message out to provide a theological and doctoral, doctrinal perspective on the purpose of marriage. Uh, I could have excavated a single passage or a single event uh, and then digested the theological components of when homosexuality was mentioned or events that it took place. Instead, what I thought would be more beneficial to the group at large is to cover as much ground as possible and to answer as many specific questions people have in regards to the subject of homosexuality. In other words, I'm going to highlight some of the most common statements I hear in support of homosexuality and then let the Bible speak for itself. Okay? And so... Admittedly, some people would argue that I'm throwing up a straw man argument because I'm not including the totality of statements. You do understand, though, that I've only got 25 minutes on the shot clock before the next service will be rolling in here. And so I, so I just took the top four statements I hear, and then we'll let the Bible handle it from there. Uh, I also wanted to say this. This is not about winning an argument for debate's sake. This isn't about undergirding ourselves with theological truths that we can just go wage war with hatred. This is about clearly understanding what the Bible says so that we can orient our lives around his plans. You follow me on this? Okay, let's do some work today. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? The first statement I hear quite often is this. Well, you know, Pastor, Jesus never spoke on homosexuality. Jesus never spoke on homosexuality. And I would say this in response, uh, silence doesn't equal affirmation, right? Like we can't build a case in support where the Bible is silent. Uh, there are plenty of words and phrases that Jesus never specifically used, but we can deduce from his overall teaching and the, and the grand revelation of scripture that he thinks certain things about certain ways, Right. And so and so the goal of the Gospels, which is the eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in your Bibles. The goal of the Gospels was not to give us a comprehensive and itemized list of sinful activities. And so instead of drawing a conclusion from silence, we have to look at what is clearly spoken in Scripture. Every passage that mentions sexuality outside of a man and a woman is condemned. More on that later. The second response to this statement, Jesus never spoke on sexuality, is this. Jesus is a member of the Godhead. Like, we have to remember that. You can't pit Jesus against God as if God was reckless on the left side of the book and Jesus is embarrassed about it on the right side of the book. And so he's like, oh, man, I can't believe my father did that. I'm not even going to talk about it. No, Jesus is a member of the Godhead. The reason why I'm bringing that up is because Jesus was there in Genesis when God created male and female. Jesus was there in Genesis chapter 2 when God officiated the very first wedding. Jesus was there when God defined family in Genesis 2 and 3. And Jesus was there when God said in Genesis 2, for this very reason, he's talking about marriage, a man will leave his father and mother. So right here we have a definition of a working family. There is a man who's a father. There is a woman who is the mother. And a man will leave his father, mother, parents and be united with his wife. And they will become one flesh. So Jesus and God are on the same page. Jesus was there in Genesis 2. When the definition of marriage was defined, he was there at Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus was there in the days of Noah. Jesus was, was there in the context of Leviticus. Jesus was there in the city of Corinth in the New Testament when, when sexual immorality ran rampant. Jesus was there throughout the entirety of the Bible. He and God are not at odds with each other. Just to keep the conversation moving, I would add this is the biggest response to that line of thinking. Jesus did, in fact... Talk about homosexuality. Every time Jesus spoke on the subject of marriage, he always defined it. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 19, and so on. But let me just read one verse. Matthew 19, 4, Jesus repeats. 
he roots his definition of marriage into what his father said in Genesis chapter 2. He brings us all the way back. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He's just repeating what God said. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, in light of the context that God created for marriage and family, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. It could read like this from the original language. Therefore, what God has defined by bringing together, let no one redefine. Let me just add this in for all the scriptural Um, theologians out there, when Jesus was talking about divorce in Matthew 19, he's talking about the context and 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 the biblical understanding of marriage being between a man and a woman. He uses the word porneia. Porneia is a reference to the porneia code. Well, where do we find the porneia code of relational and marital context? Leviticus 18, 19, 20, and 21, and 22. And so, and so, To say that Jesus never talked about porneia doesn't hold weight when you understand when Jesus talks about marriage, he uses the porneia reference in which the reference only talks about it being acceptable in God's eyes as a man and a woman. Pastor, I don't like that. God created. Now, you don't have to believe that, but you just need to understand you don't have a biblical worldview. Right? Not being hateful, I'm just letting you know there is a biblical worldview. If it's God's creation, he gets to define how his creation operates. The second statement I hear quite often in regards to this subject is, well, the Bible central theme, pastor, is love. So just let people love whoever they want to love. You know, it's almost like the soundtrack of modern day culture is the Beatles. All you need is love, love, love. All you need is love. But the Bible's more Tina Turner, right? What's love got to do with it? I got to do with it. (laughs) Just trying to break the ice. (laughs) The Bible says love is great. Love is great. But love is not the same as unconditional affirmation. I love my kids. I can't affirm all their choices and behavior and attitudes. I love them. Love and affirmation have nothing to do with one another. Okay? James chapter 5 says, if anyone among you wonders from the truth, well, somebody needs to bring him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wondering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. What's covering a multitude of sins? Coming back to faith. So the Bible says if somebody wonders from God's creation, God's order, God's plan, and they wonder, loving them while they wonder, affirming their wondering, hey, you know what, go ahead, your life, your rules. That's not an act of love. Love is to stand in their way with a heart that breaks for them and pleads with them, would you just consider what God has to say on the subject? Love is... In affirmation, love and acceptance are not the same thing. Love speaks up and tells the truth. With grace and mercy, the Bible central theme is love, so just let people, no, no, no. So under that canopy, here's, here's statements I hear. So just the other day, I was at the barber shop, and apparently as I was walking in, another minister was walking out, and that minister said to one of the individuals cutting hair that day. Um, I'm so sick of the cultural war on the homosexual community, I've just decided I'm just gonna accept everybody and I don't care. And uh, so of course, you know, (laughs) I'm there trying to get my hair cut and then, hey pastor, what do you think about, oh, okay, here we go. And uh, (laughs) and so so, uh, I just wrote down some statements that they said in response to my statements, uh, just because I hear this a lot, okay? Uh, Three statements I hear under the canopy of, why don't you just let people love? And uh, the first statement there is, well, you know, you're just judging. You're just judgmental. You're just judging people. And uh, without a doubt, people are going to throw up uh, the passage in the Bible where it says, don't judge lest you be judged. 
uh, to which the response, of course, is always, keep reading. <laughs> Just keep reading. I know the Bible says that. Keep reading. Keep reading. Because it's not pages later. It's not a conversation later. It's not a decade later. It's not after the resurrection later. In the same conversation, Jesus says, don't judge lest you be judged. He goes on to tell us, Judging people is not the problem. It's how we judge is the problem. Recognizing that there is a way that it does not align with God is not an inappropriate judgment statement. It's a factual statement. Because how can both sides be true at the same time? Either it's God-created, God-centered, or it's you-centered. You, um, your life, my rules, God's life. My... And, so, and so he goes on to say, he, I'll just read it for you. I'll just read it for you. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Everybody say, keep reading. keep reading. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll clearly see to remove the speck in your brother's eye. What he's saying is, don't go after somebody with a non-Christian worldview, acting like you're perfect, not needing the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, and you're sending somebody else to hell without realizing you were bound for the same destination, but God got involved in your life. So don't be condescending, don't be rude, don't be arrogant, but with grace and mercy and surrender say, hey, I'm not I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking the moral high ground over you. It is with love that I plead with you. I'm just a beggar telling another beggar where to find food. It's a spirit of humility is what he's saying. He doesn't say leave the, leave the speck of sawdust in their eyes so that, so that they'll eventually go blind. And they're like, oh, it rubbed me blind. Yeah, but I loved you. No. He's saying, hey, I've got some issues too. I'm a hypocrite as well. Because the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I do need to do, I don't always do those things. But there's a grace that covers my sins. And I want you to have those sin, sins forgiven as well. And it happens when we come back over here, we recognize we are sinful people in need of a Savior. What is true of you now is true of me. It's pleading with people. The other statement that was brought up is, well, you're being hateful. You're being hateful. So if I don't affirm someone's actions or behavior, I hate them. Come on. Come on. This is a plea for all social media thumb warriors out there. All right? Can we stop equating disagreement with hatred? It's not the same thing. All right? Can we stop equating disagreement of worldviews with bigotry and hatred? It's not the same thing. I can disagree with someone's worldview, but still truly, authentically love them. Right? Matter of fact, it's my worldview that tells me I can't hate you because of, because of your disagreement. It's my worldview that tells me even though you don't agree with my worldview, I will still love you. I will still pray for you. I will still serve you. I will still love my neighbor, serve my neighbor. It, it's from the worldview. Finally, finally, under this canopy of affirmation is um, you're judging me, you're hateful if you don't agree with me, and then, pastor, you're just homophobic. You're just homophobic. Obviously, the word phobic means fear of what is the same kind. Well, I would say I'm not homophobic, and if you hold to the same biblical worldview as I do, you're not homophobic either just because you disagree with someone's lifestyle. You're not homophobic because you disagree, but watch this. You are homophobic if you're afraid to tell them the truth. That's what actually makes you a homophobic. If you're, if you're too scared to tell somebody your biblical worldview in grace, in truth, in love, if you're too afraid, then maybe you are homophobic. But disagreement has nothing to do with being afraid. I don't agree with a lot of things that heterosexuals do. I'm not a heterosexual phobic. The question really is, why are you Bible phobic? Are you Christian phobic? Are you Christian worldview phobic? Because we can't just put one slipper on a phobia and not wear the other slipper. Right? And so, and so okay, let me move on. Uh, by the way, this question came in, so let me tackle this really quickly. And this is where we're going to have to put on our theological seatbelt. Okay? Um, I hope you know that it is with love that we talk in plain terms. Right? 
And uh, the question came in several times, why do Christians make such a big deal about homosexuality? All sin is the same sin. And just to answer that specific question, in John chapter 19, Jesus talks about sins that are greater than other sins. And so if all sin is equal, then why is Jesus talking about sins being greater than other sins? And in full clarity of biblical truth, because you asked, what does the Bible say? Not all sins are called abominations. And even among sins that are called abominations, the Bible says there is, there is a group within that group that is called an abomination against the very eternal moral laws of God. Homosexuality clearly falls into that line of category. Why? Well, because it goes against God's, cre uh, God's creation of divine order, his original design, and the illustration of what it represents. Two parts coming together to make up the full image of God. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, in the beginning God created them in his image and in his likeness. It's two opposites coming together to fully depict and represent the fullness of the Godhead. And it's also to symbolize God's unfailing love and commitment to his opposite humanity. Furthermore, no other sin resulted in the fiery destruction of the twin city, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so... It's like other sins that it does separate us from God, but it's unlike other sins because the Bible says he who sins sexually doesn't just sin against himself, but sins against other people. But in, in regards to homosexual practices, it is, a, it is a rebellious redefine of God's original de design of the illustration, procreation, and sanctification of sex to begin with. You say, well, I don't care. My life my desires, my orientation, my rules. By definition, by definition, that is called pride. Which ironically, I'm just talking in love. Everybody's talking about this subject. The church needs to as well. And you ask for it. The other statement I hear all the time is, well, you know, Pastor, the writers of the Bible were addressing something other than two consenting and loving adults. They were talking about temple worship. They were talking about authoritative abuse between an adult and a minor, and um, the argument carries on like that. There's several issues with that line of thinking, one being that argumentation, it really ignores ancient literature that the Apostle Paul would have known exactly what he was referencing when he referenced homosexuality. It was running rampant in and around the city of Corinth. So he knew what he was talking about. He wasn't ignorant. It's not like our culture has something new that he would have just been, wait, what's going on? No, 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 he would have known. The second, the second thing that needs to be said is that morality is not established by consenting love, heterosexual or homosexual. Just because two people consent to something doesn't make it right. But, Pastor, I feel deeply about this. And I would say, I respect your feelings. I'm not denying your feelings. I'm not denying that you have real desires. I'm not denying that there is real passion on the inside of you. What I am saying is that what the Bible teaches is that our desires do not do not build a foundation, nor do they course correct God's definition of morality. You say, but I feel deeply. That doesn't work in our civil laws, so it doesn't work in God's moral laws. But officer, I was late for work, and so I went 30 over the speed limit. You were still speeding, but I felt deeply about making up for lost time. And he's like, yeah, you're still getting a ticket, right? Uh, let me give you one more, and this is where I need to land the plane for now. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is probably the number one statement I hear in regards to this topic, and I know you do as well. So let me give you some truth behind it. Well, Christians just pick and choose what they want to believe from the Bible. Because as soon as you bring up homosexuality and what the Bible says, as soon as you bring up those two words, homosexuality and Bible, someone's going to bring up Leviticus that talks about you shouldn't eat shrimp, you shouldn't shave your beard. Do you wear clothes, pastor, of two fabrics? Uh, have you ever ate 
um, from a garden that had two different types of fruit in it? Uh, have you ever worked on the Sabbath? Should I stone you here or should I stone you over there? Not talking about stone, talking about stone, you know. And um, where would you like to die, Pastor? Because that's what the Old Testament says. And so my response is always this, in love. You know you're right. I do pick and choose. You got it. Absolutely. You nailed me. I do. I do pick and choose, but I know why I pick and choose from an intellectually honest standpoint. You also pick and choose. Do you know why? I know why I pick and choose. I'll tell you why I pick and choose in just a minute. But first, do you know why you pick and choose? Oh, I don't pick and choose. Well, sure you do. First Timothy chapter one, verse eight. We know that the law talking about the biblical worldview is good when used correctly. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred, and, and they defile what God called holy. By the way, marriage and sex is called holy. Who kill their father and mother, who commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral. This is that word porneia again. Or, he gets very specific, homosexuality. Or are slave uh, traders, liars, and promise breakers. Now, even if you had a non-Christian worldview, you would agree that murdering someone is wrong. Just because you're not getting along with your parents to murder them is wrong too. You would say, if I ask you enough questions, there is a realm of sexuality that you would find repulsive and evil. You can fill in the blank. Uh, slave trading, we would all agree that's wrong. Stealing people is wrong. Sex trafficking is wrong. Slavery is wrong. Liars, that's wrong. So of the list, you only disagree with one, you're picking and choosing. So now I know why I pick and choose. I understand that in the Old Testament, those types of laws were undergirded by three main laws. They are ceremonial laws, civil laws, moral laws. For example, ceremonial laws were given for the nation of Israel to worship in distinction. God is saying, hey, I can't have you worshiping like all the other nations who worship their gods. You're not going to be able to tell the difference who your God is amongst all the other plethora of gods, and no one else is going to know what you believe either. So there needs to be a distinction in the way you live your life to represent external holiness of an internal manifestation of God's glory. So eating um, shellfish and shaving your beard, all that kind of stuff, that was a ceremonial law. We don't operate in that context anymore because Jesus came not to abolish the law, but he fulfilled the law. It would actually be an indictment that God is not who he claims to be if I try to keep all the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament. Because it's to say, I still need to distinguish myself from what God has done. What he did was not good enough for me. I need to help him do his job. That's ceremonial laws. Then there's civil laws. Remember, the nation of Israel was in Egyptian captivity for 400 years. So in the book of Leviticus, they are now a free people. They don't know how to operate as a society. They're only used for generations. They've only been used to Egyptian culture. God says, hey, now that you are your own nation, we need to rewrite the laws for you. You don't need to live under Egyptian law, Pharaoh's law. No, this is my law. And my laws are for your good. My laws are not to punish you trying to find you do something wrong or nasty. No, my laws are guardrails. They keep you from stumbling away back into a life that never really wanted you to begin with. Because this promises you the world and it leaves you at a dead end. My way keeps you in, within boundaries of a relationship that offers you salvation and the hope of eternity in heaven. Moral laws are the ones that we abide by. So we don't, so yeah, we pick and choose. We don't need ceremonial laws or civil laws, but we do need to choose the moral laws. Moral laws were laws that God defined and affirmed throughout the Bible and are universal and generational, given for human flourishing and for his glory. So I understand why I pick and choose. This is an honest question. I'm not being sarcastic. Do you know why you pick and choose? Because if you're only picking and choosing based upon a foundation of personal preference or empathy towards someone you love, that does not redefine God's created order. So we love everybody. We show grace to everybody. Oh, we show mercy to everybody. 
We're not spiteful. We're not sarcastic. We're not vindictive. We're not haughty. We're not better than anybody. We just know our biblical worldview. And we use our life and we make our decisions and our choices centering and aligning our life around God's, God's life, God's rules. Let me be clear on this and then, and then I want to say one more thing. Homosexual attraction and homosexual desire is not necessarily unchristian, okay? Having a same-sex attraction doesn't keep you out of heaven because heterosexual attraction doesn't get you into heaven. You follow me on this? For homosexual attraction and heterosexual attraction are both desires that we must bring under control and submit to God's creation and God's salvation, okay? There's a difference between desires and practice. You can be saved and still have a struggle. Same with heterosexuality, it really is. The question is, are you willing to humble yourself and submit to what God says, hetero or homo, attractions and desires, and then submit to what God says by by asking the Holy Spirit to give you the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Let me give you one resource, and then I want to land the plane. Uh, You say, Pastor, you don't know what I've been going through because you obviously probably don't have the same desires I have. And so I want to give you a resource. It's called restoreministries.org. Here you will find a plethora of books, articles, and even classes. So if you have kids with a same-sex attraction, a parent, a coworker, a colleague, or if you're looking for a more robust theological understanding of our conversation this morning, you're going to find it there. The reason why I'm choosing to highlight this particular uh, organization is because it is uh, because its classes are written by former homosexuals and transgender individuals who were searching for truth in this sexual regard, and they found it in the Bible, and they have reoriented their life to come back to a Christian worldview. And so may that be a blessing to you, and may it fill in some of the gaps that we didn't have time to address here today. Let me repeat what I said earlier. This is not about trading moral high grounds. This is not about putting somebody down who doesn't believe like us to prop ourselves up. You know what this is? This is about us both getting off our high horse and finding Jesus. This is about no matter what your sin is, no matter what my sin is, we both get get off our, our moral high grounds and our high horses and we recognize that without Jesus, we, we are left to our own hypocrisy. Where of course we're gonna affirm all of our desires. Of course we're gonna affirm all of our definitions of morality. Of course we will, because it's my life, my rules. But I need something greater than me outside of me that would bring me back to clarity that this is God's creation. So he calls the shots. I have to humble myself and submit myself to him. God's life, God's rules. God's life. God's rules. I stand before you, a humbled man, recognizing that my sin too would keep me out of heaven. But I found a savior who was willing to wash my sins away. And so daily, I submit my life to him, desires, orientation, passion, whatever you wanna call it, to his throne, his way. I'm not holier than you. I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where to find bread. If you'd bow your heads with me. I know what's happening right now in your spirit. There are some of you that are grateful for the scriptural clarity. There's others of you that are now confused. And there's others of you that are just ticked off, if we're honest. And, uh, I would just encourage you that where there's clarity, move so humbly. Where there's confusion, continue your investigation. And where there's anger, ask yourself why. And then continue your investigation, knowing that God is patient and God is loving and God is a God of clarity. And if you keep an open mind and a humbled spirit, he will provide answers to your questions. And of course, our church is here to have continual conversations 
with you. If you would say, you know, Pastor, um, I've got some desires that are waging war on the inside of me. I want to follow God, but man, I've got some strong passions that I've been excusing or justifying. And uh, I want to give those over to, over to Christ. Maybe it's in the realm of sexuality. Maybe it's outside of the realm of sexuality and it's something else. I would just encourage you. Matter of fact, I would plead with you as the Apostle Paul would say, don't keep putting it off. Choose today who you will serve and then center your worldview around that decision, knowing that God is faithful and God is just to speak to you and to lead you on to the day of completion. So I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I am gonna ask you to lift your heart as much as you can in this moment. God, I got a war within me. Would you please declare peace and truth? So Spirit of God, I pray that you would speak to every heart in life right now. May the, may the truth of your word saturate and marinate in our spirit with kindness, not condemnation, not anger. No, 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 those, those, those emotions are not from you anyways. Let us feel the peace of God, the kindness of God, the strength of God. Kindly remove our selfish desires and exchange it with truth and grace and mercy and patience and kindness. We offer our life again to you, your life, your rules. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Amen, amen. God bless you.